This system uh, is probably best uh, shown with social media. Uh, Sean Gorman over here, he's not that shy, but he speaks very <laughs> fast. Uh, I want you to uh, listen to him carefully has taken this technology and implemented it with a very cool app that's focused on social media and social, social stuff. So, Sean, take it away. You'll oh, thanks, Jack. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, everybody. It's been really fascinating sitting behind the stage and kind of watching all the material shoot up. And, uh, and it really made me kind of reflect on, you know, it's about 20 years or so that I've been doing GIS stuff and just seeing all the great work that the community does with traditional GIS structured data. Um, and that's really what's got me excited about moving into real-time GIS and all the new streaming data sources that are coming online, just seeing what the community um, potentially could be doing with this data and seeing all the good work that could bubble up as, um, as we make these new services available. Um, so one of the things, is, as Jack mentioned, is we're extending the platform to enable these new services to come online. And really want to talk today about how we tap into social data and all the billions of messages that are moving across the globe. We think of all the people now with mobile devices as they interact with those mobile devices and they're sending messages across social media. And increasingly, those are tagged with time as well as location. Um, but there's also lots of unstructured data there as well. Um, different world than a lot of our traditional GIS data has been. So we've been working hard to extend the platform to go into that world. Um, so we wanted to give an example of that. Um, so social media played a large role during Hurricane Sandy, connecting citizens to the events that happened and connecting stakeholders to those citizens' perspectives on the ground. Um, so we wanted to tap into those conversations and show you how we can move beyond just visualization of the data and showing tweets on a map to really doing analysis of that data in real time as it's occurring. So we're going to recreate that. We used the Topsy API, and we compressed that stream and brought all of those tweets in. And we're going to replay that stream for you now and show that shift going from visualization to the real-time analysis during the event. Um, so we're going to tap into all the conversations of folks talking about Sandy and power. So we'll kick off and let that run. And we begin to see those flow of conversations across time and space. We can see the velocity of the tweets, how many tweets per second are coming across the wire. We can see the histogram. We can begin to see that pulse. We can see the ebb and the flow of the conversations. And then we can begin to look at the conversations themselves. And I'll caveat this. This is an unsanitized feed. You really never know what people are going to say across Twitter. We find all sorts of different things. And uh, it's always exciting, right? Because you know, hundreds of thousands of tweets, right? There's no way I can possibly read through and filter all these tweets. That's also the big problem. There's a lot of noise in the signal. So how do we go through and find the really valuable information, the people that are on the ground observing the events and telling us critical bits of information as that changes? To do that, we really need to move beyond visualization and just showing the tweets on the map to doing analysis of that data, and importantly, running that analysis in real time. So we'll do just that. We'll go through and we'll set up a basic aggregation. And we'll use one kilometer grid cells. And we'll go ahead and kick that off. And so here we can see now the tweets are intersecting the map. And every time a tweet intersects a grid cell, in real time, we're calculating the count. How many tweets have occurred in that particular geographic location? So now we've quantified the geographic pattern. And we can begin to look to see where there's interesting information. So as we mouse over, we can see the count and see those counts update. And we can see them change as time changes. And so now with first responders, we can go back and say, hey, we're seeing this particular grid cell picking up with activity. We think something interesting is happening there. And we have a geographic location to send them to and a mathematical pattern that we can connect them to. Um, but there's still a problem. Pretty much any time you run a query on Twitter and you do it in Manhattan, you're going to get a lot of tweets. There's a lot of people in Manhattan, and a lot of them are on Twitter. Right? So it's really just the first step. So let's try to make this a little bit more sophisticated. For one, we'll break down the granularity. We'll go down to 200 meter grid cells. And then we'll do a more sophisticated uh, equation. So here we're going to do a normalization of the data. We're going to look for anomalous activity, where we see more tweets about power than we expect, looking at all the conversations in that location. Um, 
So with that, uh, we can go ahead and uh, let it run and see. Um, and I've also done a, uh, an extra thing here where I've triggered a, uh, or set up an alert. So as this data streams across, we'll start to look for where we see one and a half times the predicted rate of conversations occur. And so if we see a spike in conversations where all of a sudden a lot of people are talking about power, then we'll see an alert trigger off, and it'll give us the grid cell and the fact that something new and different has occurred there. Um, so here we see the beginning. You know, the storm hasn't hit yet, and we begin to see that volume of conversation pick up. So if we look back at the map, we can really see the spike, and now we see these pulsing red squares. In each one of these red squares, um, we've seen that conversation pick up, and we've, we've looked at that unstructured data, and we've determined that there's a disproportionate amount of conversation happening in those locations. And here we can see the following day, as it dips down and then dips back up again, that those conversations and alerts have now moved north. Um, so they started off in southern Manhattan, and now they've moved up to northern Manhattan. And we can go ahead and mouse over one of these and see what data was captured. And so with this, we've now gone and found the needle in the haystack. And what did that needle give back to us? What was the information that was generated through the analysis? And we can see what the citizens found on the ground. Uh, so we can see that the power went out. There was a large substation down in lower Manhattan that failed. It was actually one of the first uh, red squares that popped up on the map. And um, from that, we then see that folks began to move up north. They left lower Manhattan, where there was no power, and headed north to see. And we can get pictures showing folks there and what they saw. And so now we see this observation where the power's gone out, and then the exodus of people up to Midtown and to Uptown trying to find power. So just imagine having these kind of real-time GIS capabilities, the ability to detect patterns in the data within your own organization. And this is something we'll be rolling out in the near future, and we look forward to getting feedback and seeing all the great ways that you as a community begin to implement these new technologies. Thanks. Back to you, Jack. Thank you, Sean. That's really good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gives a clear picture of the next step, right? Real-time, web-based, apps, geo-event servers, intriguing back office, but also interesting and easy to use and comprehend front office. 